Good morning, Hollywood Community Church. It's great to be with you online this morning. Uh, Jonas is taking a little break, so I have the honor of leading you in some songs of worship this morning. Psalm 113, verses 2 and 3 says, Blessed be the name of the Lord from, the time, from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning praising you and crying out to you in word and in song. Blessed be your name. Let's sing together. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes, When the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. So wonderful that we can cry out blessed be the name of the Lord when the sun is shining down on us and when the road is marked with suffering we can still say blessed be your name and the reason for that is because of the assurance that we have that Jesus is ours and we are his 
that we're heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. So sing this with me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. And this is my story. This is my submission all is at rest I and my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story morning, church. Our reading today comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 13. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be consistent in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given us this day just to gather in your name, to worship you, to glorify you. Father, we appreciate this opportunity to share forth Christ Jesus one with another. And Lord, may Christ show forth to the world around us, a world that is hurting that is in pain. Lord, we know that Christ Jesus is our salvation. And Father, I pray that each one of us would go forth carrying Christ Jesus to a lost and dying world, that our community would see Christ standing strong in each other. Father, we love you, we praise you, we glorify you this day. In Christ's name, amen. Today we're facing a lot of unknowns and um, there is one thing that we can be sure of and that is our foundation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as a church, I chose this song to help us to be, to remind us of that, that uh, we can live loud, church. We can be the hands and feet of God here in the world today with all of its unknowns. We know for certain that our faith is in a firm foundation and there's one salvation and that's Jesus Christ and the gospel. And so let's sing this together. In this time of desperation, 
when all we know is doubt and fear. There is only one foundation we believe, we believe. In this broken generation, when all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation, we believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and he's given us new life, we believe in the crucifixion, we believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection and he's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing. And in our given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade. Let the church live loud. Our God will say we believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail, for the power of God has torn the veil. Now we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and he's given us new life. We believe fiction. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back. He's coming back again. Oh, he's coming back. I just praise him so much that because of those truths, because he is alive today, we as believers, we as the church, we can wake up tomorrow morning and we can face that day, no matter what the struggles. And because he lives, it makes tomorrow worth living. So sing this with me. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know.
All right, good morning, Hollywood Community Church. We are glad that you have joined us online this morning, and we're glad that your family can worship with us, and we hope it is a blessing to you. If this is your first time joining us online, we'd love to know that you're watching with us, and so if you could just go to our website, ourhcc.org, and fill out our Connect card. We would love to connect with you this week and ask, how can we love on your family? How can we pray for you? And how can we minister to you guys? So go to our website, fill out that Connect card. If you've been watching with us for a while, we'd love to know who our online community is. And so you can go to our website as well and click on our online attendance form, fill it out and submit it. And we'd love to be able to build and see who is consistently each week joining us for our services. So just go ahead and do that right now. We just want to take a moment as well that we are going to honor and recognize our graduates this morning. So go ahead and check this out. Class of 2020, we say congratulations once again. We are so honored that we can have this time to recognize you, and we are praying for you guys, and may God give you his best. As we come to this offering moment, we just want to say thank you for each of you that are continuing to give faithfully each and every single week. This past Wednesday, Pastor Brian on our 30 at 30 on Facebook Live uh, talked with Jim Russell who leads our Open Heart Food Pantry and just what a blessing it's been to feed so many people each and every single Saturday. And we're able to do that because of your faithful giving. So thank you from all the leadership. We are so grateful that you guys give sacrificially and consistently because it helps us to bring the good news to our community. 
And so if you're sitting back saying, man, I would really love to stay faithful, really love to connect, how can I give and make sure that I'm able to give my tithes and offerings? So there's several different ways you can do that. You can mail it into us. You can go to our website, ourhcc.org. You could also use our text to give option where you just text the number and the amount you'd like to give. And you could also give through our church app by just clicking on the give tab and you would be able to give through there. So thank you for your faithfulness to give. We also want to take a moment to let you guys know that we are pumped and excited that next Sunday, June 14th, we are going to have a service live on site. And so if you're sitting back saying, man, I've been waiting to be around people. I've been waiting to see other people besides my family. This is an opportunity for you. And if you're like, yes, I am comfortable attending, here's something very important you need to know. To attend this service on site, you need to pre-register. That's right, you can't just show up. You have to register ahead of time. And you might say, Brad, where do I register for this service? Well, if you go to our website, rhcc.org, you'll see an image that says register for live service. Click on that image and you'll be able to, you'll be redirected to another link where you will see a registration form. Fill it out. You can add other registrants to that form. Just make sure you select the service that you would like to attend and then hit the submit button and you will receive a confirmation email. Now what's very important is that confirmation email is going to tell you to either print out that confirmation or you bring your phone with it on your email because we're going to be checking it at the door. This is just like going to a concert. You need your ticket to get in. So use your phone or bring it in by on paper. If you print it out, just make sure you have it because that's going to be your entrance into the auditorium because we want to make sure that everyone is safe and everyone is comfortable. So register today before the, spot, the spots fill up. So make sure you do that today. If you're really wanting to come, register right now. If you would, join with me in prayer this morning. Father God in heaven, we just thank you for your glory. We thank you for your love that we have seen on display even in the midst of this epidemic, Father God. We are seeing you do incredible and miraculous things, Father. We are seeing you just energize your church and your people to love like they never loved before and to live for you like they've never lived before, Father, and to lead their families, to lead their lives for you, Father, like we've never seen before. And this is your spirit at work. So Father God, we pray this morning that we would lift up your son, Jesus' name, Father, and that as we lift his name up, that you would draw everyone unto himself. So, Father God, we love you and we praise you, and may you get all the glory forevermore. Amen. Please continue with worshiping with us this morning. When I am surrounded Mountains round me quake when waters roar and fall. Overwhelmed with weakness, the enemy awaits, but I am not alone. That's when I.
morning, Hollywood Community Church family. I'm thrilled for the opportunity to worship with you this morning. Just think, Lord willing, next Sunday, many of us will be able to worship together here at Hollywood Community Church. I am so looking forward to that. The last couple of weeks have been extremely painful for our nation. The murder of George Floyd exposed some of the institutional racism and ethnic division that exists in our country. The Church of Jesus Christ can no longer remain silent. I have repeatedly examined my own heart and asked God to help me to treat every single individual as someone of value created in God's image. To the black members of our HCC family, we want you to know that we love you, we value you, and you are important to us. We have seen great crowds take to the streets to peacefully protest our country's inequalities. Of course, we condemn the looting and the destruction of property, but we stand with those who have peacefully demonstrated, and we support their cause. In the midst of some dark moments, and you've seen many of them on television, there have been some beautiful glimpses of light. Let me take just a few moments and show you some pictures that I trust will encourage you this morning. Don't you love those pictures? I love the contrast between love and hate, the contrast between equality and discrimination. My prayer is that God will help us at Hollywood Community Church to be the ones who respond with justice, love, and equality, and unity, I would say. Today's passage also shows a tremendous contrast. Last week, we saw Paul's desire to lay out the truth of the gospel. We saw that the gospel is powerful enough to not only change our eternal destiny, but to give us victory over the power of sin today. Here's the way Paul said it. We have been offered the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Yet now, here in today's passage, Paul pauses Because the righteousness of God must be contrasted with the wrath of God. So if you would, look in your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We're going to conclude this chapter this morning, rather lengthy passage of Scripture. So I'd love for you to read along with me today, beginning in verse 18. Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. We'll pause there for a moment. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit of God, today we ask that you would shine your divine light on these verses, allowing us to not only be able to understand them, but even more importantly, help us to be able to accept them. Admittedly, these are hard truths, and yet these are your words that you, through the Holy Spirit of God, have spoken to us. So help us to receive them today as your words And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You remember in verse 17, Paul revealed the righteousness of God. 
And yet, in the very next verse, Paul tells us that he desires to reveal to us the wrath of God. As I looked at those two verses, I questioned, why does he mention two truths so drastically different from one another in successive verses? Here's my main point today, and, and, and this is what I really want us to catch this morning. You cannot truly appreciate the magnificence of God's mercy and grace until you comprehend the magnitude of God's wrath. I really want to say it again because it's so important. We cannot really appreciate the magnificence of God's mercy and grace, his forgiveness, until we can truly comprehend the magnitude of his wrath. That's what Paul is talking about in this passage. He actually is painting the gospel with the backdrop of the wrath of God. So he shows us several truths. The first is this. He reveals for us God's wrath, or the wrath of God is revealed. Once again, in verse 18, he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Quite frankly, it might be difficult for us to accept the very idea that God gets angry or that God is wrathful. And we might even view that as something that goes against his character. After all, we view God as a God of love. However, it's important for us to realize that God's wrath is not the same as human anger. It's not like God just suddenly flares up or he loses his temper or he blows off a little bit of steam. No, no, the word that Paul uses here doesn't speak of a sudden loss of one's temper, but rather of a strong, settled opposition to something. John Murray, the Scottish theologian, describes the wrath of God this way. He says, wrath is the holy revulsion of God's being against that which is the contradiction of his holiness. In other words, God opposes that which contradicts or goes against his holy character. Often we view wrath as an Old Testament concept. Some have said that the God of the Old Testament is an angry God, while the God of the New Testament is a loving God. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is consistent in his character all throughout Scripture. He demonstrates his wrath in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. He demonstrates his love in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And so we see God's wrath in both Testaments. In Nahum chapter 1 and verse 2, the prophet said, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. And yet in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35, the writer of Hebrews says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Even in this letter to the Romans, the apostle Paul refers to God's wrath 10 different times. So, so, so what does Paul mean when he says that the wrath of God is revealed? I believe that he's speaking of two things. The first is this, and it's obvious. He's speaking of the actual punishment of sin. The fact that God will punish, God does condemn sin. We're going to see that as we walk through this letter to the Romans. Romans 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. So when Paul speaks of the wrath of God being revealed, obviously he's speaking of the actual punishment of sin. But, But in this context, he's actually talking about something else. He not only refers to the actual punishment of sin, but he talks about the natural digression ties in with what James said in James chapter 1 and verse 15. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. There's a progression, or maybe better yet, a digression of sin that takes place in man's life. 
Sin left alone has devastating consequences. Sin never remedies itself. It never gets better on its own. It always degenerates. That's the truth that Paul unpacks in the final verses of this chapter. In verses 21 through 32, which we're going to read in just a few moments, Paul speaks of a downward spiral of the human race by which man, having rejected God, is given up to do evil. So we ask ourselves the question, why does God get so angry? Wouldn't his love override his anger? Well, I would remind you once again this morning that in contrast to our anger, God's wrath is just, it's righteous, and it's fully justified. So Paul, first of all, reveals God's wrath. Secondly, he explains God's wrath. Let me read verse 18 once again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Two terms he uses there, ungodliness and unrighteousness. They're not talking about two different types of sin. They're actually synonyms that point to the same thing. So, so why is God so wrathful? Well, he explains that. And it's because of man's response to him. Notice he says, first of all, that they have suppressed the truth who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The word suppress means to hold something down, to stifle it, to repress it. The contemporary English version translates that it crushes the truth. The American Standard Version says it hinders the truth in unrighteousness. Here's what Paul is doing. Paul is painting a picture, as it were, of a gigantic spring or a gigantic coil. Try to imagine that in your mind. That, that, that would require all of our strength to push down, to compress. And so we have this big coil that we are, that, that we are trying our best to push together. And while we are pushing this spring down, it is resisting our strength. And the whole time we are pushing it down, it is attempting to spring back. You see, by nature, man takes the truth of God and he presses it down, trying to suppress it, trying to push it out of his mind. All the while, the power of the gospel is springing back, reminding him of his sin and his need for Jesus. Notice verses 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. <laughs> As Paul continues his explanation of the wrath of God, he says that man has rejected divine revelation. Two, two terms that he uses there, he says in verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, which speaks of his self-existent being, his eternal power and his divine nature, speaking of his divine attributes, the fact that he is immutable. He doesn't change. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. And notice what Paul says about these divine attributes. He says that they are clearly perceived. The Latin Vulgate translates that phrase clearly perceived as conspicuous. In other words, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that God has made this revelation about himself incredibly clear and incredibly conspicuous. Every moment since the beginning of time, God has been manifesting himself through the things that are made. Think with me, the sun comes up every morning and beautifully sets, manifesting a revelation of God. We go to the ocean and we see the calmness and the beauty of the ocean. God is manifesting 
himself to us. We look to the sky and we see the stars and the moon and, and the glory of God's creation. All of that is manifesting God to us. The psalmist says it this way in Psalm 19.1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. God is continually revealing himself to us. Yet man continually rejects that natural manifestation of God's revelation. Notice verse 21 as Paul continues, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Paul says they don't honor God. It's interesting, Paul says this, he actually uses the phrase, he says, and they knew God. Many theologians would argue that those who claim to be atheists, those who claim to not know and believe that God exists, are not real atheists. You see, they would argue that Paul is saying here that it's not that they don't believe that God exists, but that they despise the God they know exists. They don't like the revelation that they have received about God. Their problem is not an intellectual one. They know God. Their problem is a moral one. They don't want to believe and accept the God they know. So notice what Paul says about them. They are without excuse. <laughs> you know as well as I do, as humans, we are we're really good at making excuses. And Paul is saying that whenever man stands before God, he will attempt to make excuses. God, I didn't know you existed. I didn't see you in nature. God, I had questions, and, uh, and my questions were never answered. Questions such as, uh, why does evil exist, and why does this happen in the world? If you would have answered my questions, I would have believed in you, or maybe, God, Christians just turned me off. And Paul says that no matter what their excuse is, when they stand before God, they will be without excuse. The word excuse comes from the Greek word from which we get our word apologetic or defense. And Paul is basically saying that they will stand before the ultimate judge, God, without any defense, without any excuse. I'm often asked, what happens to the innocent people of Asia or Africa or South America who have never heard about Jesus. And the simple truth is, the loving truth is, that there are no such thing as innocent people. Everyone is guilty before God. God has given all of us enough evidence of himself to believe in him. The problem is not that there is not enough evidence the problem is that man has rejected the evidence that exists. So Paul explains why God is wrathful. Then the third thing that he does in this passage is he manifests the wrath of God. The wrath of God is manifested. Although most of us, when we think of God's wrath and, and punishment, we would think of that as, an, as a future event, something that will happen after an individual dies. But Paul here tells us that God is presently demonstrating his wrath on mankind. No, notice that three times in this passage, he, it says that God gave them up. Look with me in your Bibles, verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And to verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. The phrase gave up to us has the idea of just letting someone do what they want. Okay, I'm just going to give up and let that person do whatever they want. But that's not the full idea that Paul is conveying in this passage. And no doubt that's a part of it, but it's not the full idea. 
Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is showing that God's grace is not infinite. There is a limit to God's grace. And there is a time when God stops being gracious with people and he gives them over to their sin. In other words, in try, instead of trying to pull them back, he just allows them to follow that sinful digression of their life wherever it leads them. So that's what Paul unpacks in the following verses. Notice with me, first of all, that God allows man to come to his own incorrect conclusions. Verses 24 and 25, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to dishonoring or to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I read those verses and I think, what a dreadful exchange. Fallen humanity trades the glory of almighty God for a lie. Without a doubt, that's the worst trade in history. You see, as humans, we tend to worship the things God has created more than the creator himself. In verse 23, he, he, he talks about the fact that, that man has the tendency to create idols in the form of man or in the form of animals and beasts. And we might sit back and think, okay, that's for a different culture. That's not us. But think with me this morning. We tend to do the same thing. We may not worship animals and beasts, but we worship material possessions. We worship our own ambitions. We worship entertainers, and we worship athletes. We elevate all of those things above God, and we make them an idol in our life. So Paul says that God just allows man to follow his own conclusions, not believing the truth of God, but believing a lie. He says a second thing. He says God allows man to pursue his own sinful passions. Up to this point, Paul has been speaking in generalities. Paul now gets very specific. And Paul shows how our sinful passions are manifested in real human behavior. Notice verses 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion one for another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Quite frankly, I don't think we have, the time, have to take the time to explain those verses. They're pretty much self-explanatory. I would remind you today that, that these aren't my words. The, these are God's words. And these words might not be po politically correct in our culture today, but they are biblically correct. You see, here in this passage, Paul uses the sin of homosexuality as the sin most representative of the radical nature of our fall. And I admit, some of the phrases that Paul uses here are strong, and we can't ignore them, nor do we have the right to back away from them. Notice a couple of phrases that he uses. He says, first of all, that homosexuality is contrary to nature. That's the exact word he uses at the end of verse 26. Contrary to nature, it goes against God's intended design. Biblically speaking, it's not an alternative lifestyle. It's not the way that God intended for marriage or our personal relationships to be. God has always intended for man to be, or for marriage to be between one man and one woman. Genesis 124, in the very beginning, when he created man and woman, he said, A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That is God's design. In verse 27, he uses another strong phrase at the end of the verse. He says, they receive the due penalty for their error. 
That's been interpreted a variety of ways. Here's what, here's what I think it means simply. I think it simply shows that sin leads to more sin. That sinful digression that we talked about, sin leads to more sin. We saw that in James chapter 1 and verse 15. The sinful impulses and the passions that we feel are the result of God's judgment on our sin. Rather than pulling us from our sin, he allows us to follow our own sinful desires, one sin leading to another. Now let me pause this morning and say two things that I think are extremely important. First of all, I want you to know today that if you are struggling with homosexuality and you are a part of that lifestyle, we want you to know that we love you and we care for you at Hollywood Community Church. The fact that we, that we teach what God's word says doesn't mean that we don't love you or care for you. I have good friends that are homosexuals and I want you to know that you are always welcome here. We will not ostracize you. We will not condemn you. That is not our job. We will, though, point you to Jesus and trust that God will do a work of grace in your life. But secondly, I would say this, that homosexuality is just one of the sins that Paul mentions in this passage. And quite frankly, as we read through the next few verses, none of us can make it through Paul's list of sins unscathed. Paul is showing that all of us are guilty. So there's a third way that Paul says that God manifests his wrath. He allows man's mind to rationalize and justify sin. Notice verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. (laughs) I read through that list, and I know there's things that I struggle with in that list in my life. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's just a representative list of man's corruption showing that God is not just condemning this group of people or he's not just angry at this group of people. He's wrathful at, at sin, at our rejection of God and our, and our tendency to chase after sin. So much so, he says in verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give their approval to those who practice them. You see, here Paul speaks of a mind so depraved that it begins to think that what is bad is actually good, and what is good is actually bad. And as a result, man begins to give his approval to sinful actions which do not honor God. And Paul says in no uncertain terms that those who live that way and think that way deserve to die. Now you might read those verses and think, that's right, Brian. Those people do deserve to die for their sin. I would admonish you today, please do not speak too quickly. Paul is not talking about them in the passage. He is talking about us. And Paul is demonstrating that none of us are exempt from God's judgment. Very strong passage. Let me give you two applications as we pull all of this to a close. The first is this. These truths should not cause us to judge others, but to examine 
ourselves. I would remind you as I studied this that the purpose of this passage is not to highlight or condemn one specific sin or or one specific lifestyle. That's not the purpose of the passage. Paul is showing us that all of us are guilty before God. As a matter of fact, if you would turn to chapter 2 and verse 1, which is the very next verse. And I would remind you that, that man put in those chapter divisions, as Paul wrote this, those chapter divisions were not there. Paul is continuing his thoughts. And in chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. So we get to chapter 3. Paul's going to say it in no uncertain terms. There is none righteous. No, not one. What Paul is showing us is that all of us desperately need the truth of the gospel. And a part of from Jesus, all of us are guilty. Don't don't use these verses to judge others. Use these verses to examine your own life as I have done this week. There's There's a last truth and it's this. This truth should make us grateful for Jesus who bore God's wrath in our place. You see, we read about the wrath of God, and if we're not careful, it can and maybe should scare us. Remember the writer of Hebrews said, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But God is not just wrathful. God is loving, and in his wrath, he sent his own son, Jesus, who took the brunt, took God's wrath upon himself, paying the price for our sins. The prophet Isaiah prophesied about that in Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And Romans 3, 23 and 24, for all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus bore God's wrath so you and I could be free from condemnation. That's the truth of the gospel. So so today as we conclude, if you're watching and there has never been a time in your life when you have truly repented of your sins and you've realized your own depravity on your own that you cannot remedy your sin, you cannot change yourself, you desperately need Jesus. I would encourage you today in the quietness of your home to bow your head and your heart and to repent of your sin and turn to Jesus by faith, believing that the price that he paid is sufficient for you and your sins. And then for those of us who have already done that and we are gloriously saved, let's be grateful for what Jesus Christ has done for us. That gives us all the more reason to worship him, realizing that he is worthy of our worship. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of this passage. Hard words, difficult to embrace but I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would do a work in our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found Was blind but now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing
has promised good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to Thank you for joining with us today. We'll see you next week. And don't forget to register online for the service next week. Bye-bye.